Welcome to Marketplace Tech Bytes. This is our regular roundup of some of the big stories making headlines in tech this week, and maybe some you might have missed. I'm Megan McCarty Carino. This week, we are getting into all the Apple stuff, new Macs, new chips, and finally, Apple intelligence. AI writes a quarter of code for Google. And researchers say AI-powered transcription tool used in hospitals hallucinates. To discuss all this, I'm joined by our regular contributor, Joanna Stern at the Wall Street Journal. Hey, Joanna. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. So we're going to kick things off, as we always do, with our bite of the week. This is a number that gives us some insight into our top stories. Joanna, what number do we need to know this week? I'm doing, it's it's a few numbers. It's 18.1. That's iOS 18.1. And as I said in my column this week, that little decimal point is doing a lot of work there because usually you think about a point release or what you call a dot or point release. It's like, you know, not the biggest update. Right. Totally incremental. But no, iOS 18.1 or dot one, whatever you want to call it, is a huge update because of Apple, Apple intelligence. Right. So Apple intelligence, it's been a big week for Apple. It's been a big week for big tech. I mean, this has kind of been like the Super Bowl for tech earnings this week. We are getting earnings from Alphabet, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, and Apple. And Apple also has a bunch of new products. It's releasing its new lineup of Macs, some new chips. Let's watch a clip of that announcement. The new iMac changes the game once again. It comes in a parade of new and playful colors that are more beautiful than ever. And it's so much fun to pick the color that matches your vibe and add a pop of personality to your home or workspace. Today, we're excited to bring the M4 chip to iMac. All right, as the former owner of a lime green hard candy uh, Apple iMac back in the day, I'm very excited about the colorful IMAX coming back, but what else is is notable about this new Mac lineup? Yes, yeah, so I, I'm into that green. I actually really am into that green. So, but what Apple did this week was a little bit different for them. Instead of holding a big event or a smaller event like they have in the past years with Mac, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, they released or announced new Macs. And so Monday we had the iMac, Tuesday we had the Mac Mini, and Wednesday we had MacBook Pros and a little update to the MacBook Air. And the thing that's similar across all these is that they have a new M4 chip, which as you would expect is faster at everything. Um, Though, you know, it's unclear if it's really significantly faster than last year's M3 chip. But the other big thing that they released this week was Apple intelligence. And so the big message from Apple was that all these Macs now run Apple intelligence really well. I could get into the nitty gritty on some of the specs. I will say for me, I've always complained about the starting RAM or integrated memory that Apple offers. And so I thought this was a big deal. They pretty much doubled the starting amount of RAM you get for the base price. So they did that uh, really across the board. So that that's exciting. Though All if right, you well, ask anyone on the internet, what they're really talking about is the fact yeah. that on the Mac mini, they moved the power button to the bottom. <laughs> And everyone is upset about the power button. (laughs) Gosh, I had the, you know, I had the hot take, which is actually this doesn't matter at all because how often are you turning off your computer? And now everyone on the internet is either really happy with me or really mad at me. So if you're listening to this and you're mad or you're happy, (laughs) why don't you just please come and tell me because everybody else is. All right. Well, I want to get into Apple intelligence, which I feel like we've been talking about it forever. It's finally here. Who gets access to Apple Intelligence in this iOS 18.1? How do they get it? And what do they get? Yeah, I would I would say it's finally here, kinda. Like yeah. that that is not the marketing tagline that Apple would want. But if I were in Apple marketing, that's what I'd add a little tidy kinda. Because yes, so first thing is that not everyone gets this. And you have to have an iPhone 15 Pro or Pro Max or one of the latest iPhone 16 models. And then there are a number of iPads and Macs that get this. And I'm not going to go into specifics, but you know, if you've got the M chips and it, it, it's you know fairly within the last couple of years, you, you basically get this. 
But what do you get? And so iOS 18.1 is really just the first wave of these Apple intelligence features or includes this first wave of the Apple intelligence features. And what you get in there are a couple things. One, you get these writing tools, which you can highlight text really wherever you are in the operating system and get the option to summarize or rewrite it. Great for rewriting something to your boss that you don't really want to think about and you just kind of let the AI do it. There's another feature in the Photos app, which is Cleanup, which is very similar to Google's Magic Editor feature, where you can circle something in the background, let's say a photo bomber or a um, garbage can you don't want to see, whatever it is. Circle it, and generative AI will sort of fill in the background. And it's pretty decent, depends on what the background is. The other big thing, but isn't that big because it's not substantially smarter is Siri. Mm. Siri looks cooler. There's a new glow around Siri and it sounds more human, but isn't really smarter. It Mm. still really searches the web. And so all those promised features that are coming are coming in for further releases. But what's not here too is like everything that had to do with the fun Genmoji or the image playground, the chat GPT integration, all of that is not coming for another month or two. All right. You recently had kind of a wide-ranging conversation about Apple intelligence with their software chief, Craig Federighi. And one thing that you guys talked a lot about was privacy with their AI features. What were your big takeaways on that? Well, a couple of things. One thing that is really interesting, and we've seen some other tech companies really play in this space, but Apple is doing it clearly the most, is that they're trying to keep a lot of this AI processing happening on the device, not right. sending everything you do to the cloud. And so they really position this in what they call it as private cap, private cloud compute. They're really positioning this as the, they're the first real consumer privacy AI provider. And there's a lot to that. And there is a lot to also sort of just feeling like, hey, all my information and all my private information isn't going to some cloud service run by some big AI company or big tech company and sucking it up and training. So uh, Mr. Federighi did a great job telling me all about how that works. I encourage people to go watch that because it does get a little technical. Um, But like, They are late on this. Apple is behind on this. Google has had this stuff integrated in its operating systems now for like, you know, a year and a half. ChatGPT is about to celebrate two years on really, you know, ushering in this chatbot revolution. Apple's answer there is actually we're really just taking this measured, responsible approach. And Mm. so you're going to see that from us, but we want to get it right. And so Federighi said very clearly, this is a there's a long arc to this. He said a decades long arc to Apple intelligence. And so it's going to get better over time. We talked a lot about Siri and why Siri isn't smarter and how you you combine Siri. I'm sure you use Siri yourself to, I don't know, set a timer or play music. That is the main use for Siri for me. Yes. Set a timer. (laughs) And how you combine those simple tasks or those assistant like tasks with the smarts. And we got into it all. All right. Well, you mentioned Google. Now, let's get into the Google of it all this week. They also shared earnings, which made investors very happy, kind of exceeded expectations on Wall Street. And things looked particularly robust in their cloud computing business and their services business, which is mostly search. Google, of course, has also gone very big on AI. How is that showing up in their business? Yeah, What we're actually seeing, I think, across the board on earnings this week from Microsoft and Alphabet and even Meta to some degree is that their traditional businesses are doing very well. Mm -hmm. Their their revenue is up and everything is great, up, 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 up. But they're using that money to invest in the expensive creation and powering of AI. And so this is kind of the theme we're seeing this week, that while the the core businesses are healthy, AI is very expensive and they're going to continue to invest in that. What we're also seeing from Google and Microsoft is an uptick in those cloud businesses because people are using them and their new AI services. So it's all kind of cyclical. Yeah. Yeah. On the earnings call, Alphabet CEO Sundar Pichai noted that about a quarter of code for Google products was being generated by AI. What did you make of that? I don't, what did you make of it? I guess I want to say surprising, but maybe I'm not. Like twenty. I mean, you know, there's been lot. there's been a lot of kind of speculation about the degree to which I think tech companies are using AI themselves to kind of 
cut costs and cut labor. And I mean, this seemed to show an indication of things going in that direction. And it was the first kind of admission I think we've had from from a big tech company that, yeah, maybe they, yeah. You know, a lot I of think- labor is getting taken over by AI. Yeah. I mean, I had a few questions. I mean, whenever I speak to software engineers, they're definitely using AI in their day-to-day work now, right? right? To do some of the like easier writing of code. But then I also hear like, it's really not good at certain things. Similar to like how we as writers would say, yeah, it can copy edit something well or summarize something well, but it doesn't get the essence of good writing. And so I hear that similarly in code. So I I guess I was, I'm like, I would, do I think 25% of software engineers are using this? Absolutely. I do. I think more than that, right. you know, and then it's like, oh, how much of it is actually just being generated by right. AI? So I, I guess I had questions, but I, I guess I guess I'll say it's surprising. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we have questions about some problems that have been happening with AI transcription service that is being used in a bunch of different contexts, but I guess kind of the the concerning one that uh, is hospitals. So the AP reported this week on the problem of hallucinations, you know, AI making things up in its transcription tool called Whisper, OpenAI's transcription tool called Whisper. This is marketed for use in all sorts of different industries, you know, closed captioning for videos, transcribing public comments at government meetings, uh, and to transcribe, you know, what doctors and patients say. Researchers that the AP spoke with reported just an incredibly high incidence of hallucinations. One said, you know, 80% of public comments had some sort of hallucination. Joanna, what do you think this says about kind of the landscape right now when it comes to these obviously very powerful AI tools, but sometimes not totally reliable, not totally proven, but they're being integrated into a lot of businesses? Well, it it kind of, look... We had we just talked about the code example, right? right? And the stakes there are a lot lower. Yeah. Because and that's why I'm at, you know, I was a little bit digging into like what does this 25% really mean? Like, are the software engineers using it alongside? And so that's been the big pitch of generative AI for the last two years is like we're gonna use this stuff as a tool and the human's still gonna be involved. Right. And there's the human judgment and the human editing that then comes into play to say what that was generated, what was just generated is not true or does not look right or was not what was said. Um, And so absolutely this is worrisome, but also it might also be quite worrisome in the sense of how are these systems being deployed by these hospitals to have those stop gaps, to have those fallbacks of, okay, that's great that Whisper AI wrote this all and did that so fast, but, oh, that's not great that 20% of that is actually completely wrong or wasn't even ever said. Yeah. So here are some of the examples that the the AP cited from researchers. So in one case, someone said something about a boy grabbing an umbrella and the AI somehow transcribed it as the boy murdering people. Uh, Another instance, the AI just invented races for people being discussed that were never mentioned. It also invented an entirely new class of drugs, what it called hyperactivated antibiotics. So, I mean, that seems that seems pretty cool. <laughs> this does uh, not really yeah, seem you know, to be... This is, this yeah. is, by the way, OpenAI is the same company that's saying that um, their AI is going to solve all the medical issues of the right. world. So, right. uh, yeah, not to a to great start. But it, it's also interesting. It's, audio transcriptions has actually been a a pretty stable area of AI or machine yeah. learning for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it seems, and from reading the the stories that it seems they're, they, they're trying to combine here, both the transcription, but also some of the generative AI model to speed things along or help with mm-hmm. summarization, et cetera. And that is likely where things are going wrong. Um, but, you know, as, as journalists, we've relied on AI yeah. transcriptions for, for a long time. <laughs> I wouldn't be able it. to do my job without it right now. Exactly. Yeah. It's, we, we have it running on, on this interview. So, yes. Exactly. AI well, maybe it's going to... Please don't hallucinate me saying I'm going to murder <laughs> Megan. Please. Please, please don't. don't. Please, our AI overlords. Don't yeah, do it. please. <laughs> All right, Joanna Stern at the Wall Street Journal. Thanks so much for joining us. So good to have you. 
Thanks to have. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you for watching. Jesus Alvarado produced this episode, and I'm Megan McCarty Carino. This is APM.